Uh, thank you all for coming out in weather like this. And thank you all also for coming out because I realized that inadvertently I put in the title of this speech the most overused and off-putting word in the language this season, which is the word change. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, stay with me here a second. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, change is the last thing that would occur to me um, at the United Nations because of my vantage point. My office is actually in that building. Um, and you may have read recently, that building has not changed at all uh, since it was built in 1952. It's actually about to be refurbished for the first time, and it will be completely gutted inside. They won't touch the outside because that's an iconic, you know, postmodern building that's one of the most instantly recognizable buildings in the world, so you don't fool with that. But I can tell you as somebody who works there, it's way beyond its shelf life inside. And I could give you lots of examples. One of them is the United Nations has its own machine shop. And the reason for that is when a part breaks there, there is no company in the world that has made replacement parts for decades they can use. So they've got to make their own replacement parts. And then the part that broke, there's a furious competition among industrial museums to get that part. And once they get the part, they immediately put it under glass and light as sort of an icon of, uh, of what you know, was an artifact of past generations. That's how they live. The UN is. Um, the best example, and some of you in this room are old enough to get the point of this little anecdote, the best example uh, of uh, how outdated the UN is, is on the 28th floor, there's a room that has a lot of dangerous machinery in it. And on the door of that room, there's a great thunderbolt uh, warning. And it says, danger, high voltage. And then it says, in case of necessity, call Mary Hill 24477. <laughs> so why talk about changes? Actually, the, the building itself you may have read um, is about to be refurbished. It's a $1.9 billion uh, renovation that requires building some temporary structures north of the United Nations, or what they call the North Lawn there. And then in 2012, everybody moves back into the existing buildings. Um, the, uh, the architect, a guy called Michael Adlerstein, and he explained to me at one point that there would be no changes to the outside, uh, that the only change you would ever know is if you see its Con Ed bill, because it will be about 40 or 50 percent more energy efficient. Otherwise, it stays the same. Um, now, uh, inside that old building, though, there really have been quite a few changes. And um, the title of my talk might actually stand up as a result. Um, for one thing, one of the major missions of the United Nations right now is peacekeeping. Now, peacekeeping wasn't even imagined in the Charter. And what you have now is 100,000 soldiers uh, and police abroad in 20 different missions. And that's the largest number ever. Another change is a new Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon of South Korea, and I'll talk to you a bit about him. And for yet another, uh, and though it's a personnel change, it's an absolutely essential one to the United Nations, and that is a change in the UN ambassadorship. And it's quite a dramatic change because the new ambassador, Zalmay Khalilzad, is a man with a markedly different approach than his predecessor, John Bolton. Uh, the differences in those two men, I think, reflect a change right now in Washington, in Washington's approach to the United Nations, to international organizations, to the idea of working in partnership with other countries. Um, whether we like it or not, the United States is the most important country at the United Nations, and that relationship, United States, United Nations, is the most essential national relationship that exists there. Um, so in the course of the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to try to string these changes together and see if I can bring us up to date on um, where the UN is right now. And I mean to finish in 25 minutes because I'm eager to take questions and have a conversation with you about the United Nations.
Um, let me just make one full disclosure at the outset, and that is at a time when members of the press, particularly the mainstream media uh, in this country, are accused of covering things with attitude, with opinions. Um, I don't attack the UN. I don't defend it. I simply cover it. Um, the UN's value has come in for an awful lot of criticism in recent years, and much of it's deserved, and much of it has appeared in the pages of the New York Times under my byline. But I do think, and I'm actually echoing something that Ambassador Bodine just said, that it, or something like it, simply has to exist. Uh, there are proposals to do away with it, um, for the United States to leave it, um, or to simply float the whole thing off to some country that will appreciate it more like, say, France. Um, that strikes me as a non-starter. Um, in the globalized world of today, uh, you must have an international institution of some kind. And flawed as the United Nations is, uh, these sort of wishful proposals, and we've heard some of them in the, uh, in the presidential campaign right now, for alternatives like a League of Democracies just simply don't cut it. Um, simple as this, Russia and China are not democracies, and how can you imagine an international institution to work out problems that didn't have Russia and China in it? You know the argument for the UN's relevance, uh, that there are more and more problems that know no borders, and here's a quick list of those problems, terrorism, climate change, international crime, poverty, migration, public health, security, trade. The UN has never been as discredited as it has been in recent years, and paradoxically, probably never as consequential. Uh, so let me start with the relationship with the United States, which I told you was the one that's just essential to the functioning of the United Nations. The scandal of the Oil for Food program, combined with the anger of the Bush administration at the UN's failure to legitimize the invasion, the war in Iraq, um, produced a really toxic brew that that deeply polluted relations between Washington and the UN. Uh, some of it was justified, some of it was politically motivated, and large parts of the American press did not distinguish itself in sorting out which was which. Simply put, the UN found itself in the middle of a very polarized American political debate with all the attendant media hype and its reputation and the reputation of its Secretary General Kofi Annan suffered real damage. Um, remember, too, that George W. Bush came to office disdaining treaties, publicly doing that. I'm not, this is not my opinion. These are things he said, disdaining treaties and international organizations and portraying them as standing in the way of the projections of American values and goals rather than something that might aid in their projection. Now, the UN is a desolate place when its relationship with the U.S. is solid, and I know it because that was the situation when I arrived in January 2004. It was, it was mass institutional depression. It was a very, very gray place. Let me just give you two dates. Um, November 15th, 2003, I had not arrived back. I had been in Britain for eight years at that point. I had not arrived back, but November 15th, 2003, the Coalition Provisional Authority, the group, the occupational group that was headed up by Jerry Bremer, who we call L. Paul Bremer III in the pages of the New York Times, um, and the, the interim Iraqi government headed up by a man you may remember named Ayad Alawi. Uh, a lot of Iraqi leaders passed through at that point. He was one of the first ones. The Coalition Provisional Authority and the interim Iraqi government on November 15, 2003, drew up a transition document. The transition was the transition of Iran the following June, June 2004, uh, through an election, which was going to be held. That transition document did not mention the two words, United Nations. The United States, or the coalition, if you want to call it a coalition, had basically banished the UN from what was the most confrontational international moment in the world at that particular time. Reason why they felt pretty depressed at the UN when I arrived uh, um, at the end of December 2003. The second date is January 15, 2004, exactly two months later. The 
the transition document posited an election cycle that, curiously, in this particular season, there's a word that you will recognize right, right away. It was based on the idea of caucuses. Um, I think it probably was a sincere attempt by the people that designed that election to bring in all the ethnic groups of Iraq into the result, but it failed. And the reason it failed was uh, a, a man who you, whose name you probably recognize now, the Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani, came out of his house in Najaf and said, I will not accept this, um, this election scheme. Sistani then, and I still think now, does not talk to the Americans, viewing them as occupiers. So what were Jerry Bremer and Ayat Alawi to do? They wanted to pull off this election scheme. So on January 15th, 2004, those two men were at the front door of the United Nations. They came to ask Kofi Annan if the United Nations could help stage these elections in June of 2004. The United Nations is very good at doing that. It is one of the things that, uh, that they have a pretty much unblemished record, holding elections in heavily conflicted societies. And um, so um, Kofi Annan sent two... Um, officials over. Uh, one was called Lakta Bahimi, who was an Algerian, former Algerian foreign minister and, and a troubleshooter at the United Nations. And I can, in a, in a moment of personal opinion, I will tell you, a rather extraordinary international diplomat. Um, and the other was Karina Pirelli, who was a Uruguayan, who was head of the United Nations election office. The two of them went over there, they set up the elections, and the elections were pulled off. And you remember at the time, the Bush administration hailed those elections as its chief achievement um, after the invasion of Iraq. And I remember very well um, that the president uh, actually acknowledged Lakhtar Bohemia and Karina Pirelli in his State of the Union message. The reason we all remember it so well at the United Nations is we were all struck by the fact that he pronounced both of those names correctly. <laughs> now, um, the United Nations has what we call soft power. And I think it's fair to say uh, that soft power was not something that the Bush administration felt it needed or knew how to exercise. I think that's changed a great deal already in Washington just in the last year or two. Um, and, uh, but there's also a lot of evidence that the word meaning the importance of soft power has gotten out to the American public. And I just want to tell you for a couple of minutes about a poll that I was given access to. It was a poll of the American public about its attitudes about America's role in the world. And the pollster who actually briefed me on it was a Republican pollster. And I found it interesting because it had been a Republican administration which had had so changed that particular attitude uh, that we had about cooperation with the rest of the world. And here were some of the things that that pose uh, turned up. Uh, one that you will not be surprised by is that the Iraq war has profoundly changed Americans' attitudes about what their role in the world ought to be. Now, 78% of all voters, according to this poll, now believe the U.S. is less respected by other countries than it has been in the past. I, as somebody who's lived abroad, I suspect Ambassador Bodin will agree with me, can testify to that personally. I've never seen it. I lived in Latin America at a time when anti-Americanism was, was, was the, the, the flavor of the, of the year, of all the years I was there. And uh, what I see now, when I go to ostensibly friendly countries, European countries, uh, far exceeds the anger that I used to encounter in Latin America in the early 1980s. 86% of all voters now believe that working with major allies and through international organizations is a wiser strategy for achieving U.S. international affairs goals. Uh, their number one priority was keeping America strong. That's always remained constant. But something was added to it. It was keeping America strong and respected in the world. Um, they did not like the world multilateralism. Excuse me. They did not like the world multilateralism. Uh, they thought it implied a subordinate role for the U.S. The phrase they preferred was international cooperation. On the list of the most important international concerns, terrorism, no surprise, was number one at 33%. But second, at 27%, was, quote, improving America's relationships with other countries. When talking about the United Nations, these voters who were polled said the most appealing aspect for them was the idea of burden sharing. Uh, 
um, the U.S. working in partnership with other countries, not the U.S. being the primary provider of resources. So all of this seems to suggest that if the U.N. can get its act together, there should be a rosier future for this relationship with the United States. Now, another change I mentioned was peacekeeping. Even in narrow national security terms, uh, peacekeeping makes sense for the great powers. Uh, peacekeeping is a way of dealing with failed states. Uh, failed states, we know, are the breeding grounds for terrorism um, and a real security concern for Western nations. With UN peacekeepers, the West can accomplish this mission far less expensively, actually far more effectively, and with a lot less baggage than if you had to use American or European troops. The biggest peacekeeping challenge today is in Darfur, and it is an emblem of a formula that dogs the United Nations. And I've worked it out in a sort of a simple little equation, a three-part equation, and it's this. It begins with great expectations. Nothing comes to the UN unless it can't be solved out there by other countries and other forums. By definition, it's a sort of an intractable problem. And when it arrives at the UN, the expectation is the UN will somehow take care of it. So the expectations are enormous. Those great expectations then bump into the limitations. Limitations, 192 countries. Uh, ruling in a way that's supposed to be consensual. It doesn't mean purely unanimous, but you have to have the support of most of them. Most of them to get anything done. Now, uh, um, done in, in your own lives, you know the difficulty in getting four or five people to agree on something. You're probably talking about four or five people uh, from the same country you were from. Imagine 192 countries speaking different languages, coming from different cultures and traditions and backgrounds. That's an enormous limitation, and it really disencourages um, bold action. So great expectations bump into these limitations, which means the expectations are never really met at the level that they are first uh, put out there. And the result of that third part of the equation is disappointment, disillusionment. Um, there is no situation that illustrates that stark reality better than Darfur. And the UN reputation and effectiveness suffers every time these high expectations collide with the UN's built-in limitations. Now, in Darfur, for instance, it was the UN that led the way in calling attention to that disaster, um, and to that crisis. They called it the world's greatest humanitarian crisis. Um, then the UN proved unable for a long time to overcome the refusal of Sudan to let peacekeepers into the country. And as a result, the UN was blamed uh, for inaction in the face of genocide. Now, um, the UN peacekeeping in Darfur also embody a central debate among internationalists, one about what they call humanitarian intervention. Well, I did write about it recently, and thank you, Ambassador Bloody, for having picked that out. It was a rather more academic piece than you normally write when you're a foreign correspondent, and I'm glad you noticed it. Um, and what it's about, uh, here's the dilemma that I was trying to describe. It goes like this. How do you reconcile, on the one hand, the sovereign independence of the nation state, which gained a certain sanctity going back to the 17th century, and which countries in the 21st century use as a way of keeping people from meddling in their affairs? How do you reconcile that with, on the other hand, the growing conviction of the outsiders that they have an obligation to step across those borders when atrocities are occurring to people inside of them. This describes Darfur. All of this came together at the largest gathering of international leaders ever in the history of the world, uh, at the United Nations in 2005. It was the annual opening of the General Assembly, which always, always attracts lots of heads of state and government and monarchs and people like that. This year was the greatest number ever. And, and that group agreed to a resolution which codified what it called a new responsibility to protect. The phrasing of that resolution sought to square these two long antagonistic positions by saying that the world could step in, but in a nod to sovereignty, only if the state had shown it was unwilling to act itself. This responsibility to protect looked like such a good bet that it gained the ultimate UN symbol of respectability. 
its own acronym, and that's capital R, the, the number two, and capital P. You actually hear R2P said around the corners of the UN all the time now. The rights campaigners were almost giddy with this, what appeared to be a solution to this intractable problem they had, how to intervene in countries that believe intervention is sort of a form of colonialism. Um, and I just wanted to read you two quotes from the article that Ambassador Bodine mentioned. Um, one of them is from John Prendergast, who is a longtime campaigner, rights activist, and campaigner for Darfur. And here's what he said, quote, it was the high watermark when the General Assembly endorsed the concept. It was an incredible leap forward from the whole crippling debate over whether humanitarian intervention wasn't just a Trojan horse for neo-imperialism. When it happened in 2005, you believed that potentially things could be different. But in the daily slugfest of international policy making, it hasn't survived the first test, Darfur. Darfur, in short, in short, has shown that there is a great difference between gaining acceptance for a working theory and making that theory work. Uh, another quote, Samantha Power, a professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and Pulitzer Prize winning author, she said in this article, we have more than 150 countries on the books saying they believe this responsibility exists, but what advocates have begun to understand is that governments will never exercise this responsibility naturally or eagerly. They will only exercise it if they feel they are going to pay a price for not exercising it. So the pressure has to be kept on to make the theory work. Um, the United Nations is a place where the developing world and the developed world, the, uh, the Western world, of course the Western world includes countries like China and Japan these days, given their level of development there, but it's where the developing world, the third world, and the developed world come together, sometimes agreeably, more often confrontationally. As this R2P argument has showed, in much of the developing world, there is a deep suspicion that granting the power of humanitarian intervention, even wrapped in pretty reasonable words like those of the 2005 resolution, gives major powers a blank check to intervene. Now remember President Bashir of Sudan said that giving entry to UN troops would violate his country's sovereignty, and even now that he has begrudgingly agreed to let a joint African Union United Nations force start to deploy there, he is still insisting that this new force be all African. There is a third world feeling in general that the advance of globalization is basically a policy promoted by the West to replace old style colonialism. Uh, that may sound extreme, but you hear a lot of comment like that at the United Nations. Now that also carries over to the idea of United Nations reform. Um, everyone agrees, and particularly um, the more developed countries agree, that the United Nations needs a major overhauling if it is to be effective. Uh, but in the third world, reform is often thought of as a plot hatched in Washington. Uh, African countries have a particular appreciation for the UN. The UN spends 70% of its time in Africa, and many African countries believe the only place they have any sense of equality with other countries in the world is at the United Nations. Um, and they abhor the notion that those countries that pay the most um, have more of a say than those that don't pay as much. That, unfortunately, was put forward as an argument by the champions of reform led by John Bolton, um, and it had the expected effect. The third world which never liked the idea of UN reform anyway because they saw it as a way of taking away some of the jobs and perks they had at the UN, really got their back up when they were confronted with this this view that somehow the Western powers, um, because they devoted, they gave more resources and money to the United Nations, therefore had more of the say. And, and UN reform really came to a pretty crashing, disappointing end in 2005, which was the year that was supposed to have been the year of reform. Um, I, um, I have a little anecdote here that I sort of could cut for time, but let me just tell it to you for one minute, because it illustrates so well I think, and you'll probably remember the incident, it illustrates so well what the UN means to 
to um, uh, underdeveloped countries, to the third world. You may remember that in, in the General Assembly meeting of 2006, when all world leaders come to speak to the General Assembly, that the person who got the most attention was Hugo Chavez. And Hugo Chavez of Venezuela uh, went into the podium. And you remember that that podium he went into had been uh, the site of where President Bush the day before had addressed the General Assembly. And Hugo Chavez made a joke about how the Satan had been here the day before, and I can still smell the sulfur coming up you know, from underneath the podium. It got a lot of attention. Um, the delegates to the UN, they loved it. Kicking the US at the UN is always something that people will applaud and cheer. Um, and, um, and Chavez thought he was pretty entertaining that day. But I remember that day thinking that something else might happen, and I saw the realization of that several months later. Venezuela wanted to be a member of the Security Council. All of us who cover the UN, and most ambassadors I know, um, most of them from countries that did not like the idea of Venezuela joining the Security Council, thought that they would get it. I mean, they had the members, they had the countries behind them. And surprisingly for us, they did not get it. There were a series, I don't forget the number, but it was uh, 40 or 50 ballots. And finally, and it was a race between Guatemala, which the United States was backing to try to block Venezuela, and Venezuela. And finally, a substitute was settled on a compromise, and Panama is now occupying that seat on the Security Council. But it was very interesting that Venezuela didn't win that. And I talked to several ambassadors, particularly African ambassadors, and they said to me that one reason they voted against Venezuela was they didn't like the fact that Hugo Chavez had staged his satire his little circus, his burlesque, in the in front of the General Assembly, which is a body that they find pretty um, pretty sacrosanct for the reasons I said before. It's the one place they feel they have a voice, and they basically thought that Chavez was sort of fooling around uh, with what to them was almost a church. Um, well, finally, let me talk to you a little bit about the new Secretary General. I'm asked by people all the time. He's been Secretary General for the, for 13 months now. Ban Ki Moon, the former uh, foreign minister of South Korea, a, uh, his entire life was spent in the foreign ministry of South Korea, 37 years. Um, he, um, he's had two successes. Let me start with that, then I'll tell you about um, how, he's, how he's done, how he's doing. The two successes by my lights, and I've traveled with him and covered him now for these 14 months that he's been in office. The first is calling attention to the, or taking down for as a priority. It was a rather bold thing for him to do. He's a brand new Secretary General. In his very first press conference he gave, he said, I will make Darfur my number one priority, international priority. Why was that brave? Because Sudan had successfully defied Kofi Annan, had broken the word that they had given to Kofi Annan. So he was taking up what his predecessor basically had failed to do. Um, and, and, and elected to stick with that, and I will tell you later about why I think that's a success and why I think even though it appears to be such a halting form of progress, uh, I think it can be marked down as a success of Ben and his particular manner, which I'll describe to you in a second. The second success, and this one is unalloyed, I think, is having placed the United Nations firmly on the side of climate change. There is no more easily identifiable international problem, which is probably more agreed to by countries from the developing world and the developed world as, as something in need of international action than climate change. And Mr. Bond made that the focus, basically, of the General Assembly session. This week right now, there is a meeting at UN headquarters with almost everybody who's ever had anything to say about climate change speaking. There was a very large meeting in Bali, Indonesia, in December on the same subject. Um, the United Nations has no power. The only power it has the power of influence and the power to, to urge people in the direction that it thinks as an international institution they ought to be moving in. Certainly climate change satisfies that bill, and Bond has made it quite clear that the UN is going to be a leader in that area. Um, Mr. Bond could not be more different than Kofi Annan in his manner. Um, when Kofi Annan would walk into a room, you knew the Secretary General of the United Nations was there. Part of it uh, was the way he looked. He is a very graceful man. Um, he benefits from that wonderful, melodious West African accent in the English language. Um, he, I was telling some people at lunch today, I see a few of you here, so forgive me for repeating myself, 
Um, a very small point, but it's very important if you're a public figure and you've got people taking your pictures all the time. Kofi Annan has beautiful hands, long fingers, and he used to always speak by making sort of a steeple with his hands all the time. It's amazing how that sort of focuses attention. It also means that all the shutters go off like crazy, so that that also uh, brings attention to the Secretary General. Um, uh, Mr. Bond makes a very different impression. Now, part of it is, um, is his speaking matter, and it's unfair, but it's just simply true. A Korean accent in English doesn't sound nearly as good as a Ghanaian accent in English. And Mr. Bond, though he speaks English perfectly well and uses the language well, it has a little bit of a, of a, of a static effect, that accent. And I know this particularly from my friends from the television networks who have real trouble putting him on the air because he just doesn't have that kind of compelling presence uh, that Kofi Annan had. Um, Mr. Bond would never command rooms the way, uh, the way Kofi Annan was able to. Um, I, um, part of the problem also is a cultural one, and I shouldn't really describe it as a problem, it's just a difference. Um, if you are a public figure in North Asia, you're usually not very public. Uh, that's not how you get ahead. Mr. Bond, 37 years in the Korean foreign ministry, was simply not used to appearing in public and making speeches and trying to persuade people, certainly not used to making grand statements of international law the way Kofi Annan did. Um, the other thing about secretaries general, when a new secretary comes along, there's a question that people always ask. Will he be a secretary? Will he be a general? When Kofi Annan became secretary general 11 years ago, he had been a UN insider. Um, he, was, he was a US favorite. You may remember back at that point, the US was very eager to get rid of Boutros, Boutros Ghali, and they did. He was unable to run for a second term. And they, Washington certainly expected Kofi Annan to be a secretary, and he became much more of a general than I think Washington cared for in the end. Mr. Ban also, I think, is expected expected to be more a secretary than a general, and, um, and we just have to wait and see. One year is not nearly enough time to make a measurement. Kofi Annan did not become Kofi Annan in one year. It took several years. He won the, the Nobel Peace Prize after four years in office. So to make a real judgment on Mr. Mann uh, and his effectiveness is going to take a few more years in office. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, I did an interview with Mr. Bond when he first, uh, just before becoming Secretary General, and he said something to me that I think is a fair statement. I've thought of it often since. Um, he acknowledged all the things I've just been saying about his manner and the impression that he makes. And he said, don't mistake modesty for indecision. Um, I realized this this summer, uh, that, that this is what he... This is what he means about his own operating style. Mr. Bond suffered, and I know this from people that work with him, in the first months by the contrast with Kofi Annan. Uh, everybody who spoke to me, who had seen him, who knew Kofi Annan, would always be disappointed in the new man. It was a very tough, even though Kofi Annan was a very controversial figure for many Americans, he was somewhat of a maroon figure internationally, and he certainly was identified with the United Nations. Uh, and, um, and Mr. Bond had great trouble in meeting up those sort of expectations in the first months, and he suffered from the contrast. And I think I saw when he began to realize that his particular manner might be equally effective. And it happened on two trips we took. The first one was last spring. We went to the Middle East and we spent four days in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, for the Arab League conference. Um, and there, Mr. Mann chased Bashir of Sudan pretty much around the conference hall, got him into law meetings twice. The Kofi Annan was never able to do this. Um, got him into meetings. In those meetings, Mr. Bond would, after a certain period, expel all the aides, all the note takers. They all had to leave, and it was just Bond and Bashir. Bond has told me, and others have told me who are familiar with it, that, <laughs> that he's very, very persuasive, and it's sort of in a boring fashion. He is just so persistent, <laughs> and he is so earnest, and he is so all talking points. Uh, one of his aides said, they're not talking about the latest rugby match or doing buddy-buddy. He just bores in there. Um, that was Bashir in Riyadh in the spring. Um, in, in August, September, uh, I went to Africa with Mr. Bond. We went to Sudan. Uh, we went to Chad. We went to Libya. 
And in Khartoum, when we, we would spend four days in Sudan, because as you probably know, there's sort of different parts of the country where there's separate problems. There's southern Sudan, where we spent a day where there had been a 21-year war, which was finally settled by a ceasefire um, two or three years ago. And then, of course, there's Darfur. And then there is Khartoum, the booming capital um, uh, of, 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 of Sudan. And in Khartoum, he did this to Bashir again, got him in a private meeting, kicked out all the aides, and he secured from Bashir a promise to go into peace talks in Libya in the end of October. Again, something else that Kofi Annan was not able to do. Um, Bob also secured a finally, though begrudging, promise on Mr. Bashir's part to finally agree to let the United Nations in, a, in, in conjunction with the African Union, put peacekeepers um, into uh, Darfur. That peacekeeping force, 26,000, is far and away the largest peacekeeping force ever. As you probably know if you read what's going on right now, it's getting there in a very desultory fashion because the Sudanese are putting up all kinds of roadblocks for it. By the way, the Western powers have not distinguished themselves. Mr. Bond has had to go around countries, and when I say Western powers, I also mean countries like Brazil, um, that sort of middle group of countries that have adequate military resources. Mr. Bond has had to go around hand in hand looking for 24 helicopters, and he still hasn't gotten any. Uh, so in other words, it just isn't the Sudanese who are successfully sort of stiffing the UN in its effort to bring an end to the killing of Darfur. It is those countries whose leaders constantly decry the genocide going in there who are not putting up the resources for the UN. Ambassador Bergen said at the beginning, which she's quite right, very often the UN, the UN gets blamed for the sins of its member states. It is its member states, after all. And when you have the most powerful and resourceful member states not contributing what they ought to, it really puts the UN in a terrible situation. And it also enables the Sudanese to say, why are you blaming us all the time? These countries that are criticizing us are not putting up um, the resources that you need to send this force in there. Um, Mr. Bond, um, uh, this method of, of getting people one-on-one, -on -one, we then saw in a very dramatic fashion at the end of this trip, which ended in Libya. And Gaddafi uh, agreed to see him. Uh, and um, as you know, Libya is trying now to become an actor. Actually, it's on the Security Council now. Uh, and Gaddafi saw him, saw him in his desert um, uh, palace, which has a big tent outside. I've never heard about this tent. Happily, we got the chance to see it. And, um, and Bon and all his age went into this tent. The tent had open sides. We were in our own tent. We had the best tent. And we were able to look across the desert and see uh, Bon, see Gaddafi, um, and see all the aides of both sides together. And after about 45 minutes, suddenly all the aides stood up and walked out. They had been expelled by Mr. Bond, and they were all in their suits and drinking glasses of water. Mr. Bond then pulled his chair up to where Gaddafi was sitting. You've got to see, I had never seen Gaddafi before, and I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of world leaders in more than three decades of being a foreign correspondent, and it's always exciting when you see somebody who you've only seen um, in pictures, you know, we see him, in the, and Gaddafi is a very dramatic looking guy. And that day he appeared with a shirt that had imprints of Africa all over in his chest, because he now wants to be a, not an Arab leader, but an African leader. And he carried this fly swatch, this long, um, sort of cat of nine tails fly swatch, and he kept swinging it around all the time, just like in the nervous gesture. And Mr. Bond expelled all the aids, pulled his chair up, and sort of sat almost nose to nose with Muammar al-Qaddafi, and for 45 minutes, I don't know what he did. He didn't berate somebody, but he just probably bored him. But anyway, at the end of that meeting, Qaddafi agreed to host peace talks in Libya in the end of October. Um, so uh, the other thing about Mr. Bond is he has an incredible work ethic. You have never seen more exhausted aides or exhausted reporters than the people that accompany him in his trips. It's really quite amazing. Um, some of these conversations I'm telling you about after Bashir, one of the, and we, had, we saw Mr. Bond finally at quarter to two in the morning uh, after he had tied up Bashir for two hours in a meeting. Um, maybe the best thing I can tell you about Mr. Bond um, is, uh, because I think the jury is still out, uh, I, I try to make the point that I think on climate change and I think on Darfur, even though it appears to be difficult and halting, I think his manner has had some success already of just sort of pinning somebody uh, 
um, uh, to the ground until you, you let them up once they've agreed to something, even if after that agreement they then begin to do all kinds of things that compromise the original agreement. Still, uh, the agreement is there and the UN is moving ahead even haltingly. Um, and the last thing I want to tell you about him is what kind of fellow he is. Um, I've described him as being very earnest, and that's true, and um, of having a, a, a speaking style that's not quite as lilting as the one of Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan also was somebody who, uh, if you met him and were in his company, he just was a, a, a man of extraordinary grace. And, and Mr. Brown has um, a very distinguished, very correct manner. He's much more buttoned down. Um, but he has... Uh, he's been in a very steep learning curve, particularly in this area of how you appear in public. I was with Mr. Baum in, um, in Israel, and I watched him work a room of officials in Jerusalem, and he was as good as a New York politician in a room for the people in New York. Uh, he's really just gotten much, much better at glad handling, which is not something you learn if you're in the Korean foreign ministry for 37 years. Um, and he's also developed a nice sense of humor. And he, he sprang it on me at a very public moment, um, and I'll finish off this little talk with this small anecdote. I had written at the end of the African trip, in which I wrote an analysis of his style, which is much like what I've just been telling you now, this tete-a-tete, this -tete, he calls it, a method of trying to make a settlement. By the way, one other thing about that tete-a-tete -tete thing that's important I left out is, Bond will tell the Bashirs and Qaddafi's of life who he's talking to, he's saying, I'm not going to step out of here and denounce you. Um, not that Kofi Annan did that, but Kofi Annan was much more ready to make critical comments about world leaders or countries that were not cooperating. Bond resolutely will not do that, and some people criticize him for it. He describes it as part of his own belief of how he can be most persuasive. Um, so, um, I wrote this analysis, and in that analysis, I said he had a wooden speaking style. Um, and about four weeks later, we had a great gathering, black tie annual event of the United Nations Correspondents Association at the United Nations. And, um, and Bond was the speaker. And uh, from the podium, and I was sitting sort of right in front of him, he said, by the way, he said, Warren Hogg of the New York Times says I have a wooden speaking style. <laughs> I didn't know where this was going. And then he sang a song. I certainly didn't know it was going there. <laughs> and, then, and I discovered what the song was afterwards by doing some research. It was an Elvis Presley song from a film called G.I. Blues, which was a, a film in the early 60s. And the lyrics, remember I said he had a wooden speaking style. The lyrics of the song, the refrain goes, treat me nice, treat me good. Treat me like you really should, because I'm not made of wood. <laughs> I'm not sure I would really advocate tedium as a diplomatic negotiating style, but I guess in some cases it works. We'll see. I mean, we'll see. On the basis of one year. Please. You mentioned the RTP, the responsibility of human affairs. Right. Is this not implied in the Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? It is. And uh, is it not implied somehow in the, in the covenant that? It is, but I think the significance of this uh, was that it it specifically uh, made the nod towards sovereignty. I mean, it specifically said um, that the outside world can step in if the country itself does not protect its own people. That was more explicit, at least at least in the eyes of the people I know who followed this closely and, and closely who had that kind of ecstatic reaction when the thing first passed. They thought that was the important thing, is that it answered the sovereignty argument. It said, you have your sovereign right to, to protect your own people, to forestall genocide, but if you don't exercise it, then we're going to feel the right to step in. I think that's mm -hmm. no. the significance of that. As you know, with the United Nations, a lot of things turn on words, and sometimes it's a bit, some, I've covered, you know, 
uh, resolution draftings where, you know, decides to, urges to, or on the basis of, of conversations that are going for days between the guys who draft these things. It means a great deal. So I think in this case, even though it was implicit in the Charter and in the Human Rights Declaration, there is a need to have this explicit acknowledgement that yes, you have the sovereign right to deal with your own people, but if you really let them down, and we talk about atrocities and crimes against humanity, I mean, big, big deal, then, then we will exercise the right to step in. And it was felt that that was not explicitly said in those previous documents. It, it also includes states that are unable. It's, it's, it's mostly the unwilling. It's, it's when they're the, the major perpetrator of the war crime. But it can also apply sometimes if you have a state that has just uh, suffered such a, a, a natural disaster that it's unable to, to provide for its people. But it, it is basically that state might ask for. Yeah. Well, you know, they have to agree. One of the things <clears throat> you probably know about the Darfur resolution is it says that the force will go in with the consent of the Sudanese government. Now, some people, including President Bush, has said, why did they ever say that? Well, uh, you would never get a country to contribute troops to a peacekeeping force if they thought that force was going into a hostile situation. It just wouldn't happen. It would be the end of peacekeeping. And um, I thought it was a particularly fatuous thing of the president to say at that time because he knew very well that there was no way in the world you could ever get a resolution to put peacekeeping troops into a country which would not agree to receive them. And in fact, Bashir originally had said, I'll attack the U.S. if they come in here. I mean, that's where he began. So, so yeah, the consent is always an important part of it. Please. What do you think of uh, Secretary General Bond's uh, uh, early reform efforts shortly after he came into office um, regarding the Department of Peacekeeping Operations? Regarding? The uh, DPKO, the Department of Peacekeeping. The Department of Peacekeeping. So um, separated the Department of Peacekeeping from the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Some criticized uh, the effort and said it was done hastily and violated the Constitution. Do you think that's true? Um, you're, you're on to what I was about to say, which is, it's the way he did it, I think, not what he did. Uh, these were, uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit. UN reform was was the mantra of 2005. Um, should have been accomplished that year. A lot of force behind it, but I think partially because of poor American leadership, it did not get there. And that poor American leadership produced a real resistance from the third world. The third world did not behave itself well, but I think it was kind of egged down by the, the aggressive confrontation American approach to it. Anyway, UN reform did not happen. Bond, Washington was very much behind the choice of Ban Ki-moon. Washington very much expected that he would make UN reform a primary issue. He said he would in his campaign to become Secretary General, but actually in his first year, he's devoted almost all his time to international events. He's traveled an amazing number of trips. I mean, he's just always on the road. I don't mean to be critical, but it's just a fact of his first year there. And as a result, uh, I think he's not paid nearly enough attention to what goes on inside that building. Um, I think he's got a bit of time yet, but I think this year, his second year, he's got to deal with you know, reforming, beginning to reform the United Nations, or else he's going to lose the loyalty and backing of the people inside that building. He doesn't really have it yet. Uh, it's an important constituency for a Secretary General, not just the outside world, but the people that work for you in the United Nations. Um, now, what he did do, the one reform proposal he did, and he did it very early, was to, um, to reshape the Department of Political Affairs and to divide peacekeeping into two areas. One would be sort of a headquarters management kind of area, and one would be what he calls field support. Um, there's a lot of reason for having to do that. 100,000 peacekeepers out there, that's twice as many as 10 years ago. It's, 10 times as many as 20 years ago. And, um, and so just the, the purchasing and arranging and things like that are just colossal for each one of these for each one of these operations. The way he did it, though, was just a terrible mistake. And he, he paid, we all said, you know, he hit the ground stumbling. Uh, this was in his first weeks there. He simply designed this thing up on the 38th floor. That's where the executive offices are at the United Nations building. He designed this thing um, with, with aides, many of whom were Koreans, not as many Koreans as people were whispering down below, but it just was a bad thing for him to do. You suddenly thought, we have a South Korean up there, he's brought his own cadre of people, he's not acting in a transparent fashion. 
And he came forth with this proposal to divide one of the major um, parts of the United Nations. As I say, the division makes sense, but the way it was presented was just a disaster. He sent it to the General Assembly with the kind of letter that sort of said, you know, have a look at this thing, but send it back to me in a week or two once you've decided uh, whether you like it or not. A profound misunderstanding of the way the General Assembly works. The General Assembly, 192 countries, all of them feel um, underprivileged and, and underpowered when compared to the Security Council over there, 15 nations, five of whom, as you know, have the veto, Britain, France, um, China, Russia, and the United States. That's just an ongoing, uh, uh, friction is too light a word to describe it, contest at the UN. The General Assembly deeply suspicious of the developed countries and the Security Council. So suddenly he sends to the General Assembly, each country of which wants to feel it's been consulted and been asked its opinion. Um, it's just an elemental thing about how you run a legislature, and this is the world's biggest legislature. And Bond's way of doing it just could not have been worse. I remember writing stories at the time in which ambassadors came out um, by name, said um, Munir Akram, the ambassador of Pakistan, one of the big players there, said he's this, this new secretary general is treating us like we're members of his staff, not individual countries. This is only after a month that Mr. Bond had been there. Dan Gilliman, the ambassador of Israel, um, I said, you know, he's got a steep learning curve, but he better start learning faster than he is so far. It's very odd to have ambassadors by name criticizing a secretary general, but that's how bad the approach was. He then took the plans back, they redid them, they did some consultation, they then got them approved by the General Assembly, which did it sending him a, a message saying, don't you ever try to do it that way again, and in the future we accept much more, expect much more consultation than we got. So um, he has not done, paid nearly enough attention to UN reform, but I think partly it's been because he's been so occupied with these other things. Uh, in his first venture, he did it in the worst possible way. I think he's learned how to do it now. And I would expect this year we would see some new proposals for reorganizing <coughs> the United Nations. Under Kofi Annan, there was quite an elaborate document outlining it all. Very little of it um, ever got passed. And, uh, and I think Bond has got to sort of take it on that way again, a large proposal, because it's just a crying need. I mean, the United Nations will never gain the credibility it needs unless it reorganizes organizes itself to get rid of the massive mismanagement, and in some cases, corruption. Please. The, uh, when NATO and the European Union intervened in Kosovo with the ethnic violence there, they did so by defeating the Serbian army, occupying Kosovo, and now underwriting Kosovo's independence. Now, let's talk about Darfur, expand on that. Um, Darfur, we're talking about uh, enforcing some kind of a ceasefire, sending peacekeepers there, you just said yourself, peacekeepers somehow they, they become permanent peacekeepers. They don't mm -hmm. solve the problem, they simply keep the parties at peace. But, uh, so, how do you compare the, the UN approach to Darfur, the peacekeeper approach to Darfur, and where you have in part of the world where the borders were determined by the colonial powers, not by ethnic, uh, not by the residents, sure. uh, versus what Euro, the European Union did, Union did and NATO did? Um, it's hard to compare because they're just so utterly different. But um, in the case of Kosovo, as you know, the UN has been running it since 1999, um, eager to share that responsibility. Um, Darfur is a different situation where the UN is now getting involved. I mean, the UN really has run Kosovo for and uh, you know since since the end of the NATO bombardment. And um, can, can I? I don't mean to deflect your question, but you bring up something else that I wanted to mention, which is the role of regional groups. Uh, I was talking with uh, a member of the audience who's kindly come to hear me again. She heard me at lunch today. And, um, and I was telling her about one of the tensions in the United Nations right now is the tensions between regional rivalries and what the UN ought to be doing as an international institution. And there's greater and greater dependence upon regional groups like the European Union, like the African Union. And that's what Darfur illustrates. The, it's the United Nations teaming up with the African Union and, and going in there under the imprimatur um, of, a, of a local regional group. 
in Kosovo, the United Nations is getting out of Kosovo by teaming up with the European Union. Um, as you know, the plan for Kosovo, which is being resisted by the Russians, um, and which we all think will lead to a unilateral declaration within the coming weeks, um, is that the United Nations would turn over to the European Union the immediate running of Kosovo as it moved in the direction of independence. This was the plan laid out by Marti Atasari, the former president of Finland, who was the negotiator of all that. Um, so how I would compare them is they both illustrate the increasing um, dependence at the United Nations on regional groups uh, to, to take the action. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a backfire in all of that, which is regional groups who are very depressing, in a very depressing way, will often protect countries within their groups rather than take action against them. Um, Zimbabwe is a classic case in point. The African Union has done nothing about Zimbabwe. South Africa, which basically is going to be the country to suffer when Zimbabwe already is. I mean, I think they're a million or so Zimbabwean refugees have gone across the border in South Africa. Well, basically, South Africa, a country that was in effect created by United Nations sanctions, now that it's on the Security Council, rules, uh, will not vote for sanctions in cases like Zimbabwe. Um, hypocrisy is a word that comes to mind. And uh, uh, the ambassador of South Africa is a wonderful guy called Dumisani Kumala, one of the best people at the UN. He lived in exile in Brooklyn for all the years that South Africa was under sanctions by the UN. We have said to him, the only reason you're here as the ambassador is because the UN put sanctions on there and finally the apartheid government fell apart. And he, is, and he will regularly say, countries on the outside should not be trying to tell us what we're supposed to do in Southern Africa. And yet if they hadn't done that in the case of South Africa, South Africa would not be an independent country now. Um, these are the frustrations you suffer in covering the United Nations sometimes, cases like that. Um, the, the African Union in Darfur has functioned well, though it doesn't have much resources, but sometimes also they they will sort of stand in the way of more forceful action by the UN. Another case in point is Myanmar, um, a clear case of atrocities where the outside world would like to step in and do something and say something. ASEAN, which is the regional group of which Myanmar is a group, you know, criticized the, the Burmese generals a little bit, but basically has... Um, you know, those countries in ASEAN, some of them depend upon Burma for some of their natural resources or natural gas, that sort of thing. Those kinds of considerations to a very depressing degree sometimes determine the effectiveness of outside action much more than grand pronouncements or responsibility to protect pronouncements out of the United Nations. Does that, I hope that answers your question. You brought up the whole matter of, of how regional groups work right now. There is an expectation, a hope, that the European Union, the African Union, ASEAN, groups like that, with their familiarity with their regions and their countries, could somehow um, give cover for United Nations action. It hasn't happened yet in a way that really satisfies anybody at the UN. The question is really whether you think that the UN should take a position of changing the national borders and perhaps solve the underlying problem as we did. Well, um, that is, the, that is the position the UN has taken. The Marty, the Marty Atasari report recommended something called managed independence. Um, the, uh, it is not going before the Security Council because Russia has said it will veto such a resolution. So it's not going to, the UN basically is kind of out of it now. It will never become a Security Council matter. So that pronouncement hasn't been made. The, the Atasari um, uh, report, but it was very carefully written. It was to say this should not be taken as a precedent. Uh, this is a remarkably strained situation. 90% uh, Albanian population, um, a brutal example by a previous Yugoslav government of, of ethnic cleansing. Um, and, and also, it was kind of a reality thing. I mean, uh, it would be very hard to keep Kosovo in, in Serbia now. I just don't know what would happen if you tried to pass on that. By the same token, granting them independence, which, by the way, the UN cannot do. Uh, independence is recognized by individual countries. 
In other words, the European Union will take over Kosovo if it all goes according to plan, but the European Union itself will not decide on independence of Kosovo. That's an individual, it's a sovereign nation decision. It will be Britain, the United States, France, all these various countries blessing that, you know, probably, I don't know, maybe 100 countries will say you are independent. Uh, they will be unable to get into the UN because Russia will stand in the way and maybe years from now once they've established independence. The Russians are now saying, let that happen, and suddenly we're going to go to Abkhazia, which is, you know, a Russian part of, uh, of Georgia, and try to encourage them to go independent. Uh, I think it's a bluff. And, um, and I, think, um, I think the Atasari plan was as carefully drawn up a plan as possible to do what you correctly described as allow a part of a country to secede and become an independent country. But it was done in such a prudent, careful way, and it was done in a way constantly to say this should not be taken as a precedent for other countries. But as a result, there are some European countries that probably won't bless the independence. Spain is one. Spain has its autonomous regions. I mean, Catalonia might get ideas if, uh, if Kosovo or someone can independent. Cyprus is certainly one. Cyprus, Cyprus will never agree to this arrangement because of their own, their own situation. Please. In your opening remarks, uh, you, on the change, you mentioned uh, the change of ambassadors, John Bolton and the current yep. ambassadors. Could you expand a little bit on that thought, uh, the importance of that? The of course. I can... Um, and what I can do is, is sort of tell you what I wrote. I mean, I'm, I'm not a columnist, I'm a reporter, so I've got to just sort of stay with the facts. And, and let me describe it to you that way. Um, uh, a, year or so, uh, a year ago last summer, um, I, I just realized I had to write a story, a pretty important story for the front page of the New York Times, on how John Bolton was doing, because everybody was asking me. He was so high profile, drew so much attention, he had a large constituency, particularly in this country, that sort of cheered him on. Um, he did, gave a lot of public speeches um, in which he would criticize harshly the United Nations. Then he would go to the UN the next day and participate in these UN reform plans with other ambassadors. And so what I decided to do, which I thought a fair way to journalistically, to as a reporter, assess how well he had done, was to look at what he declared his priority, which was UN reform, and then to talk to the ambassadors from other countries that shared that objective. I ended up talking to 33 ambassadors over a six-week period. Almost all of them would not let me use their names. That's just understandable, and I had to, you know, I had to acknowledge that in the piece going in as we wrote it. Um, it would be hard to think that an ambassador would allow himself by name to be quoted on the conduct of an ambassador of another country at the UN. But anyway, 33 ambassadors, um, and I asked them how John Bolton has led the push for UN reform, how has he done? And with one exception, um, uh, they all thought he had undermined, not promoted, the um, United Nations reform. Some of them felt it extremely strongly. Some of them from countries that are America's closest allies in the world said to me they almost felt betrayed by having agreed to certain provisions and then having John Bolton, the ambassador, not sort of stick by them. Um, one of them told me, I did things that were against the interest of my own country. A rather amazing thing for a UN ambassador to do, by the way. I mean, it doesn't happen very often. So I did things against the interests of my own country to try to satisfy John Bolton's leadership on this issue, and then in the end, look what happened. What happened in the end was, and again, I'm still just analyzing, not trying to give you an opinion so much. This was all based on reporting. I watched it happen. I talked to these ambassadors. Um, the, the whole movement fell apart, and, and the third world uh, felt really emboldened, embittered by what they saw as a very aggressive and, and rather disdainful attack on them. Again, when John Bolton would go out to make his speeches to groups at night, those speeches got into the press and those ambassadors read what he was saying, and they saw him criticizing the UN basically as being unreformable. At the same time, they were partnering with him in the move for UN reform. So um, as to what I th 
thought of his, and that doesn't really matter because I'm just a reporter, not the columnist. But I thought it was fair to go after those ambassadors of those countries that shared America's objectives at the UN and ask them, what did you think? And that's what they told me in the end. That was the piece that I wrote for the front page of the New York Times. So, uh, but if that's all the questions, thank you very much. And again, thank you for coming on this horrible weather. I enjoyed talking to you.